Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate degree, uh, graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. <clears throat> On behalf of IWP, I would like to thank all our supporters who make IWP events possible, and I'd especially like to thank the sponsor of today's event, Mr. Colton Moore. To support the mission of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today we will be hearing from our alumnus, Dr. Enrico Swarty, IWP doctoral class of 2019, who will deliver a lecture titled, By Way of Deception Thou Shalt Do War, The Psychology of Intelligence. Dr. Enrico Swarty is Director of Psychiatry at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Director of Forensic Services at the Ross Center in Washington, D.C., and the 2024 to 25 President-elect of the Washington Psychiatric Society. A diplomate of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and Psychiatry, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Forensic Psychiatry, on faculty at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Georgetown University, and George Washington University. He has served as Chief Child and Family Psychiatrist at the U.S. State Department. Dr. Swarty studied political psychology with Gerald Post, completed his MD and a residency in preventative medicine in Milan, Italy, and obtained a Master of Science in Public Health and Policy from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Enrico Swarty. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much, Carlos, for, uh, is it working? Yes, yeah, it's right here. Okay. Um, thank you so much for helping me out with this, um, uh, with this presentation and for the kind introduction. Well, this is one of a series of uh, uh, conversations, uh, presentations on uh, behavioral sciences in national security international affairs and public safety. Um, and today's topic is uh, the psychology of intelligence. My little caveat here is that I've never worked for an intelligence agency. So I'm, I'm an observer, I'm fascinated by these topics, but I've never really been involved in the, the actual work. I doubt that somebody who is actually working for an intelligence agency would give it a talk like this. Um, can we go ahead with the next one? Okay, well, there's a famous quote from uh, Winston Churchill, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. He was referring to Russia, uh, the aftermath of the signing of the uh, Nazi uh, Soviet pact and the beginning of World War II. Well, indeed, uh, international affairs are full of, of enigmas and mysteries. Um, and if we can go on with the next. Um, well, I'll go ahead and then maybe you can. Uh, well, acquiring information and interpreting it uh, to gain insights um, and knowledge is really the job of the intelligence community. And intelligence is, uh, is key to shape uh, policy and action at strategic, operational, and tactical level um, in all the domains of operation, from land to air to sea and to space and, and cyber. The intelligence process is often described as a cycle. It starts with planning and tasking, and it goes on with the, the collection and processing of information. Collection can happen in many different ways, um, uh, human uh, intelligence, and then technical way to, co to, con to collect intelligence. And then the cycle goes on with the analysis and the production of, of the reports, the dissemination and integration. Um, and, and then it, it starts all over again. 
Um, you were able to that over. Well, my point here is uh, that in all these, the in every aspect, in uh, at all uh, at all the steps here, uh, the human factor is front and center, and uh, um, and therefore the behavioral sciences have something to contribute every step of the way. But for today, and if we can have the sec the next one, I'm going to narrow down the scope, um, this massive scope, to an overview of the psychology of human intelligence, espionage, counter-espionage, and I'll, I'm going to also touch on the psychology of intelligence analysis. So if we can go on, and here I have a, a clip. Uh, um, so if you're familiar with the International Spy Museum, you may recognize the story that's, uh, that is featured actually at the beginning of the visit in a small room. The protagonists are the Palestinian uh, Mozab Youssef and the Israeli Gonin Itzhak. Um, Mozab um, is one of the sons of a leader of Hamas. And he was recruited by Gonan when he was a um, uh, Shin Beth uh, operator. Um, and uh, uh, he was nicknamed the Green Prince. Green is the color of, of Hamas. As we play the video clip, if we can, I'd like to, I guess, to pay attention to what the two protagonists say about um, about recruitment and also about the bond. So the recruitment of an agent and the bond between the agent and the handler. Okay, let's, let's try if we can. This is my chance to be a hero for the sake of the nation. But Allah had other plans for me. to make the other side feel our pain. Recruiting is an art, very difficult art, limited to making betray his own people. He asked me, would you work for us? To collaborate with Israel is the most shameful thing. The first day, I mean, was the first day of the end of my career. We called him the Green Prince. My father was the top Hamas leader in the West Bank. I mm, had no clue, but I was doing it. It's like recruiting the son of uh, the Israeli Prime Minister. Deep in my heart, he was really terrified. A good source needs to be with you, not against you. You are a target, and you can be killed any time. I really felt responsible for myself. As a source, as a human being. I was on my own. He was in a real trouble. I start to realize that people are dying because of this life. This is a big game. No one else knows about you. You will start to lose your sense of reality. It's not just the source. He was there for us all the time. That kind of bond is impossible to break. How tough? So you heard Gonan uh, describes the uh, recruitment as an art, as a difficult art, right? And, uh, uh, and Mossab says that the bond between the agent and the handler is something that you cannot break. Huh? And so I, uh, and, and you know, Mossab now is, lives in the US. Uh, he has been granted political asylum. He's been disowned by his family. And it's interesting also that another brother from that family uh, later on in, under different circumstances defected from a mass. And also um, gone and uh, um, moved on and uh, left Shin Beth and is an attorney. Anyway, I want to take a look at the uh, relationship between agent and handler here. Agents are selected because they have access to 
or they have the potential to have access to information. They are part of an organization that is targeted or they can infiltrate an organization of interest. And an agent operation involves um, spotting the individual, developing a relationship uh, in order to assess the individual and to see if they are uh, suitable for recruitment, then attempting recruitment, and then fr going from there. So running the case, uh, handling the case, handing it over to other case officer until the case is suspended or ended. Right? The other scenario is the scenario of the walk-ins, the people who volunteer their services and uh, they, they, they but either way, in either scenario, there has to be an assessment, there has to be vetting, right? And that's where the art, you know, of recruitment is, the intuition, the wisdom, the experience uh, of, of the operator. Uh, but there's also, there is also a role for the um, behavioral sciences here to play. Maybe I can have the next one. Profiling people is a multi-dimensional endeavor. I'm following here uh, a model uh, from these authors here that I give credit to. The book is The Psychology of Spies and Spying. There are six dimensions in this model uh, that influence individual behavior, starting from a cultural background and then the personal background the uh, intellect of the person, and then the personality profile, including the dark side of the personality, and finally, the motivation. I'm gonna highlight here uh, some of these dimensions. Can I have the next one, Carlos? Thank you. Well, culture is very important. As uh, Lawrence of Arabia uh, here says, the um, British agent, British Thai, uh, we, really have to be students of cultures in, in, this, in this field. Um, human operators have to be students of cultures. And if I can have the next one. Um, Gert Hofstede is a social psychologist who has become a thought leader in this area. Um, for over 50 years, he has studied, uh, started studying the international workforce of IBM, um, the cultural factors um, that differentiate, uh, you know, different countries and so forth. And uh, um, his research is actually publicly available online. He has developed a matrix uh, of six dimensions that characterize different cultures. Uh, for example, uh, power distance, which, you know, is how accepted the hierarchical order is in that culture. Or, uh, for example, uh, individualism versus collectivism. So how loyal an individual is expected to be to the group in that culture. Um, so having something like this in mind uh, is important for a human intelligence operator uh, it can inform the way they go about recruiting and handling um, agents, how they interact with them, what, what they expect from them. Next one. So, of course, the, the personal background, the psychosocial factors, uh, you know, shape individual behavior in life. You know, the upbringing of a person, the, the family of origin, the, its dynamics, you know, the losses the, the, and also the, the successes and how they were managed in, in early life, very important. Intellect is also very important, is a reliable predictor of performance because it predicts the ability to reason, uh, process information, uh, deal with new situations and learn, learn new skills. Huh? Um, Next one. And all of the above, all of the above contributes to shaping the personality of the individual. Personality traits, personality factors are um, important because they relate to how people 
uh, feel and think and, uh, and act. Um, now, of course, you know, human intelligence operators are not there to run psychological uh, tests, but it's useful to have a framework in mind. Um, and there are established models of uh, personality. It is important to identify these personality traits because they are really relatively stable over time. Uh, they're the product of genetic and environmental factors and uh, will uh, uh, inform how the handler, uh, how the handler interacts uh, with, the, with the agent. Um, especially recognizing when these personality traits, personality profile become inflexible uh, and maladaptive. So become personality disorders, right? Because personality disorders manifest in poor stress coping mechanisms, uh, problematic interpersonal relationships, disruptions across the lifespan. And so those are vulnerabilities uh, that can be uh, used, but also have to be kept in mind when, uh, when uh, you know, a case is handled. And of, can I have this next one? Particularly relevant are the you know, so-called dark uh, triad of the personality. So, for example, narcissism, the entitlement and exploitative style, um, psychopathy, the callous disregard of norms and other people's rights, and Machiavellianism, the manipulation and, and conniving. And, you know, if we add sadism, the enjoyment of you know, from other, others uh, uh, suffering, we have a tetrad, um, the dark tetrad. So, next one. So access uh, to wanted information is key uh, for, uh, you know, for being interested in an in, in individu individual and trying to recruit them. But then, Assessing, and so assessing their cultural background, their personal background, their um, intellect, their personality profile, very important. But then the motivations. What is the motivation of this person? Um, and motives, of, of course, vary and can coexist. This is uh, a model that uh, includes personal factors, factors related to the individuals, as well as factors uh, related to the relationship of the individual with the organization they belong to, they work for, as well as the relationship of the individual of interest with the handler. So from the, as part of possible motives of the individual's uh, greed, so money um, is one, but also creed, their ideology and changing uh, ideas, right? Um, blackmail can be part of this, so a coercive motive, you know, compromise, I believe, is the word the, you know, the Russian use, right? So compromise. But also ego in terms of excitement, you know, the, uh, the thrill-seeking experience of breaking, breaking rules. Huh? Um, and then when it comes to the individual and the organization, ego in a sense of a wounded ego, a disgruntled ego, right? The dissatisfied person who has an ax to grind, who is angry with the organization, and so is, uh, you know, is ready to, to betray it. And then when it comes to the relationship of the individual with the, with the handler, that bond you know, that Mozab was talking about, that friendship, that dependence that can be created. Now, this is all one side uh, of the coin, no? because the others are trying to do the same thing. They're, saying, they're trying to recruit their and, and handle um, agents, right? Uh, from, uh, you know, from our side, right? So, uh, so now I'm going to shift here uh, to, uh, to the espionage, counter-espionage, and just to 
uh, to set the stage, you know, the United States as an act on, of Congress originally from 1917, the Espionage Act that prohibits obtaining information, recording pictures, copying description of any information relating to national defense with the intent or reason to believe that the information may be used for the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. So that's sort of, you know, that sets the stage here. Um, can I have the, the next one? And of course we have convicted spies and I have here two pretty illustrious case. Ana Montes, who was a decorated DIA uh, officer, senior analyst, but in reality was uh, worked for years for the Cuban government. And you see what she has to say about it, that the morality of espionage is relative. And then another case that you may recognize, they are Aldrich Ames, who spied for the Soviet Union for uh, something like 10 years. He was a walk-in, as a matter of fact, and uh, offered his services in exchange of um, substantial amounts of money. And his, um, uh, his spying led to actually the, the deaths of, of many assets um, in the Soviet Union were um, sentenced to death, or at least in one case, they committed suicide. So if we, if we can have the, uh, the clip here. They paid with their freedom or their lives in destructive cycles of tit for tat. The men like Polikov gave up names. They gave up secrets. I did the same thing for reasons that I considered sufficient to myself. I gave up the names of some of the same people who had earlier given up others. It's a nasty kind of circle with terrible human costs. Aldrich Ames is serving a life sentence with no remission. Dmitry Polyakov was sentenced to death. He was executed in 1988 with a bullet in the back of the head, then buried in an unmarked room. Yeah, so General Polyakov, one of, one of the people that uh, Aldrich Ames gave, gave in. And you see how he says, I'm a traitor, yes, but I don't feel like one, right? So that's, that's, his, um, that's his perspective. Well, I'm gonna review a little bit some literature here and some work done in this field. Uh, starting from uh, a seminal paper uh, written in 1975 by Gerald Post, who at the time was a CIA psychiatrist, um, who actually directed the center, the, the, uh, he, he was the chief profiler of foreign leaders, but he was contributing in other ways as well. And, uh, and actually, uh, this paper was um, declassified, it was published in a declassified version in 1998. Well, what Post was doing at that time was really giving tips to the human intelligence, U.S. human intelligence operator, and he was saying, this is what you should look for when you, when you try to recruit. You should look for people who have a pattern in their personal, in their work life of split loyalties. Um, they've not been loyal to their um, spouse. They've been, not been loyal to their employers. So they have a history um, of that type. And also they have a sense of entitlement. They know what the rules are, but they don't think that the rules apply to them. Right. Well, the, the government has uh, dedicated a significant amount of resources to studying the problem of the insider threats, insider spies. Um, in 1985, after uh, the arrest of a Navy officer for espionage, Anthony Walker, the then Secretary of Defense, uh, Weinberger, established a, a commission, um, which was led by a retired general, uh, General Stilwell. And it produced a, a report. And from this effort came later 
two, uh, the, the creation of two organizations that were given the mission of researching the psychology of, of, of traitors, of insider spies. Uh, the Personnel Security Research Center, based in California, and the Community Research Center, based in Virginia, and known also as Project Slammer. Uh, the, the, the former, PERSEREC, went on to collect data from uh, over 120 cases of espionage, starting from World War II. So, so they, they reviewed a lot of records, right? and analyzed the records. Um, and they identified six key motives, uh, money, uh, so greed, ideology, coercion, um, so blackmail, uh, disgruntlement, uh, ingratiation, uh, and uh, you know the sense of self-importance and the thrill-seeking behavior. The other project, the Project Slammers, they operate in a different way. They went to interview in person uh, between 20 and 30 um, spies who, went, uh, who underwent hours of psychological evaluation. Um, and uh, and the, the, they, they found that these individuals perceived themselves as special, deserving more than what they had, um, and uh, they were uh, assuming that rules didn't apply to them, and they were able to rationalize and compartmentalize what they were doing. Huh? And they did not see themselves as traitors, just like Aldrich Haynes. Um, so that's, that's all consistent. Huh? Next slide, I'm going to go with another author who is actually a very well known here at uh, IWP, is part of the IWP community, uh, is a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Charney. Um, he has presented his work uh, here and has published it. Dr. Charney had the opportunity to actually work directly with several um, uh, insider spies uh, that, who were referred to him by their defense attorney. Um, and in addition, he studied other cases. And he developed a paradigm that includes three key idea clusters. Uh, one is the core psychology of the uh, of the insider spy, which is a, a sense of uh, a profound sense of failure, of personal failure, which whatever that means for that person. Huh? Um, another uh, uh, core idea here is the existential dilemma in which the insider spy uh, is stuck. It's a cycle of uncertainty, fear, and despair. And then Dr. Charney developed uh, also a model which include 10 life stages of the insider spy, a dynamic view, a view of how they are made and unmade. So that's uh, Dr. Charney, also an important contribution in this area. And the next slide, please. And uh, this is also an, another author I'm following here um, uh, who has contributed um, in this area, uh, a, a, an intelligence um, community psychologist, Dr. Ursula Wilder. She has uh, studied extensively the psychology of espionage and has published two papers that I'm aware of. The first was in 2003. Um, she identified three essential elements for an individual to enter espionage. Um, personality pathology, so a sort of an underlying personality pathology, um, a, an ac acute personal crisis in life, and then the opportunity, the ease of opportunity. So Dr. Wilder reminds us that uh, uh, Personality, uh, you know, sort of, you know, problematic personality traits are not uncommon. You know, all of us can have uh, some of that, right? But in healthy personalities, the 
the positive characteristics counterbalance the negative ones. Um, so we have uh, capacity to uh, feel sympathetic to others in a genuine way. We can feel remorse. Uh, we have our own uh, uh, morals, our own self-discipline. And or we are uh, uh, able to adapt tactically uh, so that we don't do uh, bad things because in the end we know that we would lose. We would lose our partner, we would lose our job, and so forth, right? And so this balance gives um, an array of coping strategies. Now, in pathological personalities instead, everything become rigid and structured around a few dominant, uninhibited characteristics. And so the range of coping techniques is limited. If you add to that crisis that further degrade the thinking, the judgment, and behavior, that leads to a loss of control, right? And a well-trained recruiter can spot this, can recognize these uh, mechanisms and uh, this vulnerability, and can match the situation in which the target is in order to uh, recruit. In some cases, they can all even foster crisis. They can even manipulate the person. Mm -hmm. So in order to provide that opportunity, that ease of opportunity, that is the third uh, piece of the third element in Dr. Weiler's analysis. I have the next one. So she returns, Dr. Weiler, to the same subject you know, in 2017, a new paper, um, also published in Studies of, uh, of Intelligence. She has the same model with the personality pathologies, the life crisis, and the opportunity. But here she focuses on um, leakers, and uh, she includes leakers, and she focuses on how this plays out in the digital age. In, in, the, in the cyber uh, spheres. And what she says is that personality pathologies don't change, but the cyber sphere um, offers opportunity to amplify, for example, narcissism, for example, that immature uh, inability to distinguish reality from fantasy, right? Also, the cyber realm uh, can uh, uh, generate or contribute to exacerbate life crisis. Huh? But the greatest impact on all this uh, is on the ease of opportunity. Because uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the cyber, there, there is this proliferation of media platforms that grant anonymity. And there is this immediate the possibility of having immediate access to a global audience. And so she talks about leakers, right? And how leakers are, the whole situation with leakers is different from the classic espionage. Um, also because there is no handler there who is there to manage, to stabilize uh, things, right? And how leakers uh, seek quick rewards and and, and impact on a global scale. The gratifying attention comes in the form of fame and infamy at the same time, and uh, uh, acclaim, excitement, power, and, uh, and so forth. That's quite different from the secret world of espionage, right? So a case in point with the next slide, uh, if we can play this uh, clip from the movie uh, about Edward Snowden.
which is basically all of Dylan numbers there. Let's say your target is a shady Iranian banker operating with his tank, so you can watch him get stuff, you can also watch him get things that he can get keys off to, including, you know, his cousin, who's just some dentist. Okay, so you, you get his, his point, right? And uh, I have here uh, more leakers, you know, quite uh, uh, recognizable. Chelsea Manning, the former U.S. Army intelligence analyst who in 2010 uh, leaked uh, classified information that was then published uh, by WikiLeaks, uh, including uh, thousands and thousands of, of uh, uh, diplomatic cables. And Julian Assange, uh, the founder of WikiLeaks, who actually Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers, uh, whistleblowers, uh, describe as a kindred spirit, right? Uh, so leakers do not see themselves as, as treasonous spies. They don't see themselves uh, as criminals, of course. They think of themselves uh, as whistleblowers. They are exposing what they deem to be uh, wrongdoing. They want the public to be aware. They want the government to be accountable, right? Um, that's their perspective. And, and then the last one is Jack Teixeira. Uh, you may remember this is a recent case, um, uh, U.S. Air, Reform, uh, Air Force Reserve, who posted sensitive material, um, including classified material about the Ukraine war, uh, on an online gaming chat group uh, on a digital platform, Discord. And in this case, it doesn't even seem that he had any any real problem with the government or that he was trying to become, you know, infamous or famous globally. It seemed like he just wanted to have some recognition within that small co uh, community for the work that he was doing, right? So there are different stories here. There are different, uh, you know, different motivations, but it's all different from the old fashioned espionage but the common denominator is that in the, in, in the era of, of cyber, uh, there is uh, increased ease of opportunity. And that's what Dr. Wilder says. So what should be done about this? Well, she goes on giving some advice, you know, how to uh, mitigate the risk, you know, safeguarding entry points to the intelligence community, community building up the resilience of the workforce, uh, but also recognizing early signs of alienation, countering loneliness, um, increasing the in-person connection. Those are some of the points that she makes. Um, all right, we can move forward. And I'm gonna switch gear here and uh, move to the last part of this presentation when I'm, I want to want to touch on the uh, psychology of intelligence analysis. And I have another clip here. So in August 1978, the, uh, the CIA published, I mean, internally, a report, a study on uh, Iran and, and the Shah. Um, and the conclusion was that Iran was not in a revolutionary or even a pre-revolutionary situation. A month later, uh, in September 1978, the DIA uh, had an internal uh, study that concluded that the Shah should stay in power for an another 10 years. Well, the Ay Ayatollah Khomeini was sitting uh, in, uh, in the outskirts of, of Paris. He was in exile and clearly had a different plan. 
because a few months later, actually there was a revolution in Iran. And if we can play 30 seconds of that. Uh, the illegal government, which the American government is supporting with, so if they seize that one, and they start Can we to go back to beginning or to, us, of that? And have very friendly relations with us, and then according to our uh, Islamic teaching, there is no reason for us to be in, in Tehran. Do you have in, had some success, you and your followers, in changing the governments in Tehran? Do you have feeling any feeling for how long it may be before there is an Islamic state in Iran? It is very close, and very soon we will announce a new government. Are we talking about days, weeks? Can both. Probably two days. From CBS News, Pontiac, unrehearsed news interview. Yeah, so. On Face the Nation. When I we, we, we can stop. So, so, yes, so this is January 14, 1979. Two days later, the Shah actually left Iran, went to, into his own exile. And just a few weeks uh, after that, uh, the Ayatollah uh, Khomeini returned to Iran as supreme leader of the theocracy that, uh, you know, over 40 years later is still there. So how does this happen? When in, in hindsight is 2020, right? But uh, that intelligence analysis is not easy work. The data that is collected from the operational environment has to be processed to become information. That information has to be analyzed to produce intelligence. Sir Omond, who was, is a former director of the British uh, Sigint Agency, has this uh, SCES model. Uh, he talks about initially the situational awareness, it's knowing who is doing what, when, uh, where. Um, then there has to be an explanation of why is this happening. And from there, there are estimates, estimates of what will come next in the short term, and then the forecasting that is more strategic and long term. Now, the reality is all this is based on, uh, um, all these judgments are based on information that is incomplete, that is ambiguous, that is filled with uh, deception also that the adversary introduced. Um, so with this pro premise, I'm going to move on to this, the next. Um, and I'm going to follow here the work of Dr. Richard Hoyer who um, worked at the CIA and the Department of Defense for over 50 years and established his authorship on the subject of cognitive psychology and intelligence analysis. So he focused on the cognitive limitations that contribute to intelligence analysis failures. Um, and the, you know, the main point is that we do not have conscious our, the human mind is not experienced consciously most of what happens. Um, many functions that are associated with perception, me memory, information processing are not really consciously directed. Um, perception is not, per perceiving is not recording reality, it's constructing, reconstructing reality. And what our minds does is construct simplified mental models of reality and then operate within these models, right? In other words, we tend to perceive what we ex expect to perceive based, based on schemas that we have uh, made, right? And uh, in impressions are formed quickly they're based on limited information and they resist change. New information is assimilated to pre-existing schemas and it's difficult to look at the same information um, from different perspectives. So this is how the human mind works. So this is inevitable, right? Now add to this the reality, the reality of uh, operating in a fast-paced environment, the demands, 
the bureaucratic uh, mechanisms and pressures, the interpersonal issues, the uh, relationship with the consumers of the product of intelligence, their own bias, their own expectations, um, the fact that they may not like ambiguity, the fact that they may not like to hear something that doesn't go with what their mindset is about a certain topic. So all this leads to what is psychologically uh, described as premature closure. And so that all contributes to, um, to making mistakes in intelligence analysis. So what can I have the next one? So what is, you know, what is the answer or what is an answer? What Dr. Hoyer contributed uh, to uh, establishing uh, analytical tools and tradecraft procedure to help analysts question assumptions and be more objective. Altogether, they're called structured analytic techniques. There are many of them, um, and, uh, um, uh, and there is even a, a primer prepared by the uh, government, Tradegraph tra Primer, where these structured analytic techniques are uh, described and the, it, the use of these techniques uh, uh, even a timeline is, is proposed for the utilization of these techniques. For example, analysis of competing hypotheses, one of the structure techniques. And it starts with a brainstorming session in which uh, a set of alternative hypotheses is identified rather than be beginning with one hypothesis, right? So uh, there's a matrix on top. Uh, there are the hypotheses listed, and then the evidence is, uh, is listed on the side. And the process is the scientific process of ruling out based on evidence. So rejecting the hypotheses that are not supported by evidence until what's left cannot be rejected based on evidence. So structured analytic techniques as a way to aim for objectivity and, uh, and really correct uh, these uh, cognitive limitations that are part of uh, you know, human nature. Huh? So the last slide here, um, just to say that we, uh, this is, you know, a, in a way, just the tip of the iceberg. A lot more can be said about behavioral sciences in an intelligence process, an intelligence cycle. But the, the, the message, you know, and it's the message of this series of, of conversations, is that uh, being psychologically minded uh, when working in national security international affairs, law enforcement, public safety uh, is, uh, is useful. There is nothing to lose there. There's probably uh, a lot to gain. And there are many other topics that we can explore in the future. For example, uh, the psychology of negotiations in crisis, uh, the uh, behavioral assessments of threats, and, uh, and, and targeted violence. Um, and, and then we can expand you know, the, the scope and also include medical intelligence, medical diplomacy, global health security. And this is really the idea that myself and another psychiatrist who studies here, at IWP, Dr. Gandhi, have, we would like to put together a course you know, that covers all these, uh, all these topics, all these, some of these topics. And, and so stay tuned. Thank you. I don't know if there are questions or. Um, so a lot of what you went over was fascinating was to, um, 
in terms of looking at how the intelligence community uses psychology, a lot of it is descriptive. How good a job do you think they do in using science, what's studied, and incorporating that you know, of psychology, psychiatry, of these areas into their tradecraft? How good a job they do? Um, well, there is, uh, you know, the fact that I'm finding all this material, you know, means that uh, it's it's there and uh, uh, and that there are people working on these things uh, in the intelligence community. Um, how good a job they do? You, your question is how good a job they do actually incorporating in into their, uh, for example, the human intelligence operation. I don't know, you know. But I would think that, you know, if, if the government, if the agencies are um, investing in, you know, making an effort to study these things, then there's got to be some, uh, you know, applications, you know, in, in the real world, right? In action. But it'd be interesting to hear from somebody who's actually doing these things. So this is done in the context of spying for nation states, uh, but you can imagine sort of less consequential instances of spying. I mean, spying for a company or maybe even just betraying a, a friend or something. So how, how does you know, how does that relate? Are these the same people? Are they? Does it matter of degree? How, how do they? How does the psychology of that? I haven't really looked into that. It's a very interesting question, though, and I would think that uh, you know my gut reaction to this is that uh, it's probably very similar what you would find, right? Um, because you know it's going to be about money. It's going to be about uh, uh, switching uh, beliefs. It's going to be about disgruntlement and. Uh, it's going to be about uh, the, the all, all the things that uh, you know have been identified by the, who have uh, by people who have studied this, you know, uh, by reviewing records and interviewing extensively and running psychological tests. And uh, so I would expect that there is a, uh, there wouldn't be a much, but I haven't really looked into this. Is there a uh, typical Myers-Briggs type indicator for a good spy? I don't know. It's a, I know that the, the, the government does the... I, I would think that there, uh, you know, good spies come in, uh, in different uh, ways, uh, shapes and forms, so that different uh, profiles, you know, um, but it's 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 another good question. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, thanks very much for an interesting presentation. I know it's a much of material the stuff you covered, like good spies and Myers Briggs are kind of Western, Indian American instruments. How well have you followed done at listening as the first book you showed was uh, to other cultures and um, to see if any of it is really reflective of how they think about spying or So you're saying the personality profiles, how do they apply to other cultures if or in they, general? If they apply. I mean, those are Western notions and ideas. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, I, I think that you know, and I, I said it, that culture really matters there. Um, so good question, good question. Um, I, I haven't really looked into that, but the, uh, whether this construct, this psychological constructs really apply to other cultures, well, that has to be put in context. And, uh, and the, the, cult the, 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 the studying of culture is really, is really key. Um, No more questions? All right, well, thank you then.